So I would like to start by asking you all a question. What is the single greatest challenge faced by our, by our generation? Unfortunately, there are many plausible candidates for this, right? Who thinks it's climate change? Hands up. Yeah, climate change. Yeah? Plastic and our oceans? Yeah? What about antibiotic-resistant disease? Oh, that's good. A few? Air pollution in our cities? Yeah, one or two? How about artificial intelligence taking over our jobs? No. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> so, these are all really significant challenges, but I believe there is one challenge that is perhaps even more existential, and really uh, the clue is in the name, mass extinction. So, uh, right here in Germany, where we're sitting now, 76% of the insects have disappeared uh, over the last 30 years. So that's an extraordinary thing. Over three quarters of the insects are missing. And this was observed for the first time when amateur researchers worked in the national parks in Germany. So this was not just not in cities, but actually in national parks in places of ecological richness. People had noticed it casually. They'd noticed they didn't get any more bugs on their windscreens when they drove quickly down the autobahn. Uh, and uh, this turned into a, a, a real piece of data, a terrifying piece of data. Um, it's not just in Germany. In, the, in North America, 30% of the birds are missing from the skies since 1970. So this is something that's going on worldwide right now. So what's going on? Well, the author Elizabeth Colbert has suggested that right now we are experiencing the sixth mass extinction. So this uh, infographic shows in red the species uh, that are currently threatened. And it's especially bad, which is why I will show you a few of them, that uh, for the amphibians, for frogs, newts, salamanders, and so on. So according to some, amphibians are currently going extinct at 25,000 times the background extinction rate. That's an extraordinary number. So wh what is really happening? Um, just a couple of months ago, a new UN report suggested that one million species are at threat of extinction worldwide. What's causing this? Well, you rem may remember that the last mass extinction was caused when a, a giant asteroid collided with the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, causing the dinosaurs to be wiped out, or at least those of them that didn't evolve into the birds. But right now there's another cause. It's not just Trump. In fact, according to Elizabeth Colbert, all of us are the asteroid that is currently colliding with the Earth. All humans. Is this something that we should be worried about? Some people might say, well, you know, does it really matter if uh, lots of species go extinct? Um, couldn't we get along just as well without some of them? Isn't it just part of normal evolution? Well, I, I, there are many discussions about whether we ourselves will go extinct as a consequence of the current mass extinction. And it, it, it's, it's a difficult question to answer conclusively because humans have shown a remarkable ability to survive ecological collapse. But I come from Ireland, uh, and uh, in Ireland it's still a painful memory of the great famine of the 19th century when um, one million people died and another one million people had to emigrate because of dependence on just one crop, the lumper potato. Um, I think that shows the risk of dependence on a very small number of life forms. Uh, when we lack rich ecosystems, we are much more vulnerable to threats. And right now, we don't have anywhere to emigrate to. And uh, some people suggest we're going to go to Mars. I'm not convinced, personally. I think we need to focus on this planet. Uh, artists have en can engage us really powerfully with the topic of, of extinction. Some of you may remember Sudan, the last white uh, northern rhinoceros, uh, the last male white northern rhinoceros, who died in Kenya about a year ago. Um, and Sudan, uh, before, he before he went back to Kenya, actually lived in a zoo in the Czech Republic. 
and uh, an artist, Daisy Ginsburg, has now brought Sudan back to life with the aid of artificial intelligence. So she has created uh, a 3D animation of Sudan, which has copied all of the behaviors that he exhibited in this zoo. And I think it's very powerful. I'll just show you a little taste of that. So I find this personally a very poignant way to connect us with a species that is in the process of going extinct. Um, this is on right now actually in New York uh, in the Cooper Hewitt Museum. It's been a special con commission for their tr uh, current triennial on the topic of nature. Um, I would like to move from Africa to another location, to Costa Rica. Um, so this is the Oza Peninsula, a very beautiful place in Costa Rica. And another artist, Bernie Krauss, um, has done an extraordinary thing. He's gone around the world uh, for the last over 40 years collecting these soundscapes of rich locations of biodiversity. And Bernie Krauss went to this exact place in Costa Rica twice um, before and after a process of selective logging. So that doesn't mean complete deforestation. It just means when you take some of the trees out and visually, actually, the forest doesn't look very changed. But acoustically, it's a very different experience. And I would like to show you how you can experience biodiversity through the ears. So this is before. And after logging. So I think this points to one of the reasons why this uh, loss of biodiversity is occurring. So deforestation. So in 2017, one football field was deforested every single second throughout the whole year of 2017. So that gives you an impression of the extent of what is going on. Why is it being deforested? Well, primarily in order to feed clothe and fuel almost 8 billion people on this planet. So generally uh, for agricultural purposes. And the example we're seeing right now in Amazonas is just one of the more graphic uh, examples of this process. Um, I'd like you to do a little thought experiment with me. So if you were to go and weigh all of the animals on Earth, right, and imagine that you, on one side you have all the wild mammals and birds, and on the other side of the weighing scales you have humans and livestock. Which do you think would be heavier? So it's interesting. Some people might think it's more or less the same. Uh, some people might think it's, it's a slight difference. But actually, people have done this experiment. And um, what happens is that there, it turns out there are 95% of mammals and birds on Earth are either humans or the livestock that are there to serve us. So only 5% by weight are the wild animals. So the, all the elephants, all the hippopotamuses. So in a way, all of these wonderful nature documentaries that we see present a somewhat distorted vision of the world. In fact, the world is really just a gigantic farm uh, with a few wild animals uh, there to please us. Um, how, what can we do about this? So there's um, some really bold proposals out there in terms of addressing the problem of mass extinction. Uh, one really ambitious project has been developed by this incredible scientist called E.O. Wilson, and it's called the Half Earth Project. So imagine that half of the Earth is fenced off and turned into a giant nature conservation area. So that's the proposal of E.O. Wilson. An amazing idea. And um, 
I mean, this idea is very powerful, but I think it also, um, in a way, underplays the connection between humans and nature. Because right now, for example, most of the biodiversity in many locations is actually in cities rather than in the surrounding countryside. So I think we need other approaches. And my proposal for you is that we, a key element of addressing this problem of mass extinction has to come through building empathy. Building empathy not just between humans and other humans, but actually across species. Um, and what does empathy mean? It means stepping into someone else's shoes, but it also means experiencing the feelings of another. My first impression of how important empathy was occurred uh, some years ago, back in 2005, when I was creating a robot festival in Dublin, Ireland, called Save the Robots. And you can see me in the background of this picture wearing the mushroom shirt, and I'm with an uh, artist called Garnet Hertz, uh, who created this amazing invention where he attached a Madagascan hissing cockroach, a very large cockroach, and he put it in a little harness, and he allowed it to steer this robot, which you can see in the picture. And then we released it in an organic fruit market in Dublin. And we were very curious to see, where is the, ro the robot uh, going to go? Where is the cockroach going to be attracted to? Is he going to go for mangoes or oranges or apples? Or what's it going to be? But the interesting thing wasn't where the cockroach went, it was the reaction of the passers-by. So almost everybody came up to us and they said, oh, is the cockroach okay? Is he going to be harmed or is he in pain? <laughs> Luckily, we were able to tell them, well, actually, Madagascan hissing cockroaches, when they're upset, they hiss very loudly, so we know he's actually fine right now. Um, but can you imagine the reaction of these same people if this cockroach appeared in their kitchen? I think it would have been rather different. So, so this revealed to me the power of creating certain situations that actually can propel people into a state of empathy. And the neurobiology of empathy is something that is being understood ever better these days, the role of the mirror neurons or so on. But empathy appears to have a very strong role in change of attitudes and change of behavior. Who doesn't know somebody who uh, is besotted with orangutans and refuses to eat palm oil products? Um, or, for example, uh, somebody who is aware of what happens in the ad, uh, industrial, industrial agriculture with animals and uh, therefore has become vegan. So th these are all processes driven by empathy. So how can we scale up empathy? How can we scale up interspecies empathy to support biodiversity? Well, I'm suggesting, in keeping with the DeLorean, that we need to look back in order to find a future solution. We need to look back to an ancient institution, which is the Natural History Museum. Uh, this is the Natural History Museum I used to visit as a child in Dublin, known as the Dead Zoo. It's a beautiful place. I, I loved it as a child. Um, uh, but it was a place where one has immersive experiences. Natural History Museums at attract huge audiences. So, for example, the museum in New York is one of the top visitor attractions in New York, and it's an immersive place. Um, but even more importantly, research has shown that museums are among the most trusted institutions in the world right now, more trusted than journalists, more trusted than the, the, the politicians, than government agencies, and even more trusted than scientists. So in an age of distrust, museums can offer a powerful way forward. But we need to reinvent them. How do we, how do, we do that? So I am creating a, a new museum in Munich called Biotopia, and it has the goal of reconfiguring the relationship between humans and other species. And a key element of that is empathy. And we're working with some of the most amazing scientists, but also with artists and designers to engage with these themes. We have an incredible location at a beautiful spot, uh, Schloss Nymphenburg, right here in Munich, uh, uh, where we are creating this museum. Again, a combination of an old location with new ideas. We are doing this through one simple idea, connect people with other species through the behaviors that we share. So let's look at behavior. Let's look at why plants eat. Let's look at how animals sleep. Let's look at how a, s a snake can see an in infrared, so it can see the heat coming from a mouse. Why is it that male seahorses give birth rather than females? Uh, but ultimately, what we want is for the visitors to look at themselves differently as a result of the experience in Biotopia. So we talk about the stoner moment, when you look at your hand after you've been through the museum and you say, this hand is amazing. How could we create that for our visitors, that reflexive moment? 
I just want to end with the, the fact that I believe we're living in a very hopeful moment. People are taking the, to the streets uh, for climate change and also to protect biodiversity. Right here in Munich, we had an amazing thing happen this year called Rette die Bienen, Save the Bees, when people, 1.7 million people signed a petition to save bees, leading to radical changes in the legislation around biodiversity and agriculture. So this is, I think, a potential shining example to the world of what is possible. But this is a campaign that was powered by empathy. You can see even from the picture, people are identifying with bees. Um, you know, I, th I think save the wasps wouldn't have had quite the same appeal. So we have an extraordinary chance. We have an opportunity. Museums are powerful instruments to offer immersive experiences, to cultivate trust, and offer shifts of perspectives about this key issue of our time. But Biotopia is only part of the puzzle. We need you all to be involved. Let's do it. Let's move from extinction to empathy. Thank you.